So uh, while we have Jeremy come on up and uh, get set up, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, intro for him. I met him at, uh, he was throwing a party uh, for the celebration of the veto of SB 1047, right? So you would think this is a pretty creative set of folks that are very forward thinking, right? This is to ensure that we continue to drive innovation. So Jeremy is the founder and CEO of OmniScience. Also, uh, anybody here of AGI House? Hands up, you've heard of it before? Well, here's your founder, founder here of AGI House, uh, but we're gonna focus on some of the other initiatives he's doing now. So uh, once we're all started, uh, I wanna give you a, a warm, warm welcome, please, for Jeremy Nixon. <laughs> welcome to what I hope is an insightful and perhaps a little bit inspiring talk on the future of knowledge generation. I just, out of curiosity, I, you know, it can be an issue of contention, even among researchers. Who here believes that AIs can be creative? Can be creative. Okay, wow. So actually, if you had asked that question a meager five years ago, a huge fraction of the audience would have said, oh, we all know that creativity is uh, something that is uniquely human. And they have a depth of belief in, um, you know, this sense that a part of who we are uh, part of our nature, human nature, is the ability to create new knowledge uh, ostensibly out of nothing. And I would like for a moment to challenge uh, that underlying philosophical intuition, but also argue that we have no idea how weird and intense the creativity of these AI systems is about to get. So these are two very simple examples of where we're at. Two nature papers, uh, both out of uh, DeepMind, uh, and some Ways for me, it's actually nice to be back at Google. So I was a researcher at Google Brain for three and a half years. Um, and a lot of these colleagues went on to produce work like AlphaFold and FunSearch. Um, so what's the idea here? So in the case of function search, mathematical discoveries from problem search with large language models, um, you search for, you know, in the case of FunSearch, uh, functions that replicate some interesting mathematical behavior. It could be a proof, uh, it could be an algorithm. In the case of uh, AlphaFold, you have um, you know, this really specific model which is um, predicting the folding patterns of proteins. And in these contexts, we are creating uh, what I will call generative knowledge, which is a new knowledge that's coming out of these models. Now, uh, there's a sense in you know, the company that I'm working on, Omniscience, that this generative knowledge will be much more general. Um, and so in a lot of cases, uh, we will, for example, generate a legal defense. And in this context, Knowledge is about case analysis. So you can do a novel form of search where you have a generative model output all of the cases that are relevant to some uh, example of interest, some uh, you know, brief that's being written, and then you execute a search query on the basis of your generated citations. And that search query will turn up dozens or perhaps hundreds of relevant articles to the case in question, and you can pull the content into context in order to ground arguments that are being made. And so in you know, what feels like an instant, you are getting hundreds of case-grounded arguments being made with you know, appropriate legal intonation and writing. And they can be written up in any structure or format. So in our case, I, you know, that's sort of akin to the veto party, this is about the unconstitutionality of California Senate Bill 1047. So it's an AI arguing that artificial intelligence should be held up as a form of speech, that mathematics should be held as speech, that code, which has historically been held as a form of speech, so it should maintain that. And in general, that there's a constitutional challenge to be made to any legislator that wants to write a law that stops um, AI from making claims or that stops you from, from implementing an AI. And this entered the lexicon. So there's this um, set of professors uh, three professors wrote an article countering this AI-generated brief in Lawfare Log. And so it enters the public conversation uh, through Twitter where, you know, 300,000 people have sort of looked at this article and there's like sort of large stewing debates about it. But nobody in this conversation, not the law professors, not the people reading it online, knew that the entire article was generated end to end by a creative AI. We also are in this world where, um, you know, books that are Amazon bestsellers, uh, books with names that you know and love on them, people who you trust, um, those books are in part being written by generative systems. 
So how would you feel about a generative system that went through every note you had ever written, every document, that went through every conversation that you had had, and compiled every creative instinct that had left your mouth into your book, or all of your books? And so we're in a world where you can hook up your Google Drive to a system, and in parallel, have a system compile all of these semantically similar contents across all of the documents you've written in the course of your life, and write a book about every single one of them in parallel, doing the equivalent of a you know, PhD's worth of work, work that in many ways you've already done in you know, a context of an hour. Um, but what's more important in my mind is actually research. So there's the question of um, the future of research biology and research physics and research mathematics, um, but also this sort of lurking sense that the ch chains or agents that we build would be able to create entire novel research frontiers in a day, where some creative instinct that the intersection of fields that perhaps did not exist, take computational sociology uh, of artificial intelligences as an example, um, may be burst into existence, where you could write a thousand novel papers on the basis of experiments that are being run, uh, not necessarily on synthetic data, but perhaps on real world data, gathered by an automated scraping system that puts together the basis of, of a computational sociology frontier. And so what you're looking at is a cited research paper. Um, you can basically do search to check, you know, the quality of citations to check whether they're adherent uh, in the sense that, you know, the cited paper actually makes the claim that's being made inside of the research paper. But uh, a lot of this stuff is, is taking over uh, academia. So if you take a look at the research publishing frontier, um, there's this moment, this chat TV moment, November 30th, 2022. And what you see in the you know, resulting months is a staggering rise in the fraction of LLM modified sentences. So a number of researchers did an um, analysis and found that in the context of computer science, uh, within a few a mere months, uh, we were already at 17.5% of the papers on archive be written by artificial intelligence. Um, uh, in the months that have passed since the publishing of this paper, uh, things have certainly continued to transform. But here you can see electrical engineering, uh, you can see statistics, and you know, even physics in blue is sort of hit this six to seven percent uh, sentences as likely being generated. And you can uh, sort of extrapolate a lot of these curves um, to a world where not only are humans using systems like omniscience to write papers, they are actually reading papers that are entirely based in an, a generative AI system, which has basically become its own automated research frontier, where the data of interest is sort of fully accessible to these AI paper writers that are automating the data analysis at a level of scale and quality that's hard to replicate, where if you have a visualizer that can create glorious visualizations using code generation and where a lot of the tables and, and data analysis and the sort of training of models are being decided by an AI agent that can you know, then go on to write a full paper with tables, et cetera, about it. So um, why should we believe that any of this sort of generative knowledge is accurate or correct? Well, um, as you go through life, you acquire an epistemology, <coughs> pragmatically speaking, some standard that you hold information to some standard that lets you believe something or not believe something. And in the context of science, most fields have some distinct scientific epistemology. Uh, I've listed a few of them for you here. Uh, so take the context of psychology. Uh, they'll run t-tests and they'll run p-tests in psychological studies and use that to determine whether or not some psychological phenomena is true. Now, we know about p-hacking and how much these epistemologies are corrupted by the incentive to fraud that assaults so many fields of science. And you know, especially you know, an important, sorry, not to claim that psychology is not important, but in very important sciences like biology, um, people actually invent you know, images. In the, call, in the case of Alzheimer's, there's sort of this massive case of fraud in the case of psychology. Um, you know, Francisco Gina from Harvard was sort of found to have doctored a huge fraction of her data. Um, but, it's in order to get at this underlying epistemology. So actually, how can we create you know, an unfakeable or unfoolable epistemology is a question. So second, I list benchmark and metric evaluation in machine learning. And 
I will get into why this is actually a really functional epistemology, pragmatically speaking. The reason we respected the transformer was actually because the benchmarks that it blew away were being competed on by dozens of other models. And so you know that there's been some improvement in the discovery of your inductive bias when you can compete with all of the other algorithms which are on an open platform. Um, I think ML has done a phenomenal job with openness and with the co continual improvement of the metrics by which we evaluate. Uh, but even this is subject to a lot of issues and a lot of companies edge, you know, the edge of OpenAI or Anthropic, is that they have a better benchmark suite that is private and, and that we don't have access to. So uh, how are you gonna get an edge? Well, you improve the quality of your epistemology and ideally the quality of your model follows it. But um, you know, in the case of mathematical proof, there's sort of really hard uh, evidence that everything that's generated is correct. Uh, and there's this book I love called Homotopy Type Theory uh, that is mostly generated by an AI hype, but it's actually 10, 10 years old. So it's, a, it's not an AI in a classic sense. It's a proof assistant that um, basically discovered most of homotopy type theory as written up, but which was rewritten so that humans could easily read this algorithm's proofs. And so the mathematicians have actually spent a decade in this world where they're contending with a tremendous amount of knowledge that's being generated by computer algorithms that can automatically be evaluated. Um, you can see a number of the other you know, epistemologies that I'll reference here, but my core claim is that for any given scientific epistemology, you can form an evaluation criterion that, you, that can be attacked by a generative model coming up with creative solutions, whether they be creative experiments, whether they be generative algorithms, uh, whether in the context of bio, they be something like you know, AlphaFold, uh, or in the context of math, something like AlphaProof or function search. Um, basically, when you have these evaluation criteria, you can combine them with creative candidates in order to create a paradigm of automated research, where you're generating tremendous amounts of knowledge, often in a sort of parallelizable way, and where the actual struggle will be to cope with how to comprehend the enormous amount of verified generated information. Um, and so this is where I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work. So uh, this is a paper that we put together recently uh, called Omega. It's about optimizing machine learning by evaluating generated algorithms. And so uh, what we've done is actually create novel machine learning algorithms that outperform on a dozen downstream benchmarks. Now the context of this is classical machine learning. Uh, maybe you, you guys remember you know, your olden days, k meters, support vector machines, decision trees, which lead into random forests and gradient boosted decision trees, and the, like GVMs and XPUs that uh, won all our capital competitions uh, back in the 2010s. Basically in this context, you can give a um, short algorithm, like k neighbors, to a prompting system which will come up with dozens, perhaps hundreds, of variants of the algorithm. And you can basically bias your search via meta-prompting to focus on the ones that incorporate novel principles. So in the case that you see here, uh, we have what's called multi-level abstraction, which is a generated algorithm that asks for a version of k neighbors that includes the concept of abstraction at multiple levels which is you know, a classic scientific paradigm. You know, in physics, everything is compositional. The way that atoms compose into molecules compose into some high level analysis. Um, let's take this idea of most level abstraction as a way to represent data and apply it to a k-nearest neighbors model and then have, in this case, Sonnet, so Quad 3.5, um, generate an algorithm in the inspiration of that idea. Similar story for this hybrid k-n classifier. Um, and it's encoded to try to be creative. So what this algorithm did in the case of multi-level abstraction is it invented a eigen decomposition scheme where it did eigen decompositions at different levels uh, of compressibility. So it, it modified the feature space at three different levels and then created an ensemble out of its distinct compressions of the data. And that algorithm, relative to sort of standard Kinger's neighbors, uh, blew away the benchmarks in a dramatic way. Uh, relatively speaking, so uh, you can see on Y, breast cancer digits, et cetera, um, it sort of close to maxes out where this sort of standard k neighbors algorithm does not perform. And so this is, as far as I knew, the first example of inventing new machine learning algorithms, and I'll show you how to verify the novelty of the algorithm in a moment. 
but inventing new machine learning algorithms that outperform on downstream benchmarks in a way that's reliable in that if you give this kind of system any uh, high level idea, you can use Metaprompton to generate lots of low level algorithms and evaluate those in an automatic way. Um, and the way we evaluate is actually essential. So we have this psychic learn DSL, which lets us execute the evaluation. So this is some uh, code. To be clear, all the code that you're looking at is generated. Uh, no, no human wrote this. This was invented by an artificial intelligence. Um, it's called multi-level abstraction KNN. Um, what it does is it, it imports this principal components analysis sort of uh, decomposition technique and then uses it in an unusual way. So it applies it for feature abstraction where it iterates through various levels and at each level it changes the overall number of components that it wants to preserve. And then it ensembles those re-representations of the data with one another at instance time. And in combining those predictions with each other gives you a final prediction. Now, um, there is some interest certainly in the creative solution that was generated by an algorithm that was merely prompted to do multi-level abstraction and then decided to do aggregate composition with various feature levels. Like that in itself, somewhat creative, somewhat interesting. But um, what's essential to the creation of the system is the paradigm. So we actually use scikit-learn as our DSL, where the fit and predict uh, functions exist in uh, this library which we're calling Omega. So Omega actually has thousands of different algorithms, all of them generated, uh, all of them performing. But it, they all have this class with a fit method and predict method, which makes it trivial to use a standard evaluation benchmark in order to check whether the algorithm outperforms. And if you have enough downstream data sets, so in our case we have 12 downstream data sets, you can get a very <coughs> robust evaluation of these generative algorithms that's not subject to the kind of statistical issues you might see in an overfitting context. So the, the model's not merely overfitting to the data, it's actually finding a novel inductive bias that outperforms on a tremendous number of downstream tasks. Um, um, yeah, people often bring up no free lunch theorems, uh, but in my mind this is typically a kind of philosophical confusion um, where there's a real world of data distribution. And actually part of the reason that say, creating boosted decision trees reliably works so well is that it's modeling an underlying real-world data distribution which is consistent. Um, and so we don't live in a random world, we actually live in a very structured world. We're looking for the algorithms that can pick up that structure, and this is a generative process for inventing novel algorithms of that type. Um, I, I should also give you like the inventive principle behind the scikit-learn DSL. So really what you need is an evaluation process that's automatic and functional. And in our case, because we have fit and predict, we can automatically evaluate it. But there's a second upside to it, which is um, this background sense that the context in which you are generating influences the quality of the generation. So if you, if you generate citations in LaTeX as opposed to in standard English, your model, because it's a simulator of the underlying data distribution, will simulate as though it's in the context of a research paper, as, if, as opposed to as if it's in the context of web text. In the case here, you're generating as if you are in the context of scikit-learn, and that in and of itself improves the quality of the generations. Um, and secondly, there is this real uh, sort of importance to having a reliable process. And so because of the fit predict paradigm, we can reliably evaluate thousands or tens of thousands of novel algorithms in parallel um, in a side-by-side -side way. Cool. Um, so, uh, part of the reason, so before you guys raise your hands around believing in creativity, part of the reason that I've always believed that creativity could be automated is there's this system for creativity that I call systematizing creativity, um, which covers things like abstraction and generalization with a transfer from similar problems to, or which have a solution to uh, other problems that have similar types of solution. Uh, similar story with composition and recomb uh, recombination. If you are, say, uh, you know, even like taking the human language, combining two words that haven't been seen before. So I guess in the case earlier in the computation, um, computational sociology. Those words together in indicate an entire field of research. And so you can see that as a type of composition that almost lays the conceptual groundwork for a tremendous number of novel insights and discoveries. Um, in our case, certainly decomposition is very important. So. It's a, a really core scientific principle of reductionism and attempting to break things into their parts. And as soon as you have the parts, you can be creative at the level of the parts and then recompose them into a novel whole. 
And so much of creativity and engineering operates by this simple principle. But because we have the abstract representation of creativity itself, we can instruct a model to execute these creative mental motions in parallel on a tremendous number of important subproblems. And so this, the force of this is really, uh, you know, on some level, the word cell is a revenge, which is that, uh, you know, suddenly if you have a conceptual representation of something, because of the prompting scheme and the ability to use instruct and fine tune, in order to have that prompting scheme lead to, lead to creative downstream behavior, even in code gen, even in math gen, um, now a conceptual representation of creativity is enough to, um, to basically find new worthwhile creative veins in these fields of generative research. Um, and so what we've discovered is there are a number of reliable forms of knowledge creation. So uh, one is data analysis. So it's possible, I'm sure you've all sort of, who's like uploaded some spreadsheet data into ChatGPT and used a code interpreter to come to some interesting conclusion? Oh wow, we fewer than I expected. Um, so basically, uh, if you are not aware, you can take any data source of interest, you know, your finances for the month, uh, and put it to a model that can do data analysis, and you can instruct it to do any form of data analysis that you like. And the crazy thing is that if the model finds new information inside of that data, you can have a report be written about it in an automatic way, and the report will be correct and about real knowledge that was baked inside of that data. And so by giving a data analysis platform the um, ability to say, take user data, the user can contextualize the knowledge that's generated to their personal life. Um, now, I think there's an extension of this, which is actually uh, akin to what Anthropic is doing with computer use. But who knows about computer use, sort of the ability to have this algorithm, you know, modifier manipulate your computer? Okay, so also very few. So basically, um, there's, there's this ability to look at your screen with an image model. Uh, and in this case, it's kind of multimodal intelligence and how it factors in. But basically, by representing every action that you'd like to take as an action that then AI can take, on your computer, it has access to things like all of the spreadsheets that you're generating or the ability to download data that's contextual to your life. And a lot of the knowledge that you really care about is heavily contextual. You don't care about a random person's skills, you care about the skills you don't know about your employee that you already have. Uh, you really care about you know, the talk that you're gonna give tomorrow personally as opposed to some abstract information about some like non-contextual talk. And so this is, in my mind, essential, is basically the, the user's data needs to make it into the knowledge generation process because that's the knowledge that, that you personally care about and that affects your life. The second is synthetic or real data as benchmark with creative solution generation based on Metacron. Um, and Omega, the algorithm generator that I just sort of described to you, is an example of this synthetic data as benchmark, creative solution generation as Metacron. And then finally, there's this reliable composition of existing knowledge which leads to knowledge. And in many ways, um, this is the hardest to automatically evaluate, but is also uh, you know, the holy grail, so to speak, because there's so much existing knowledge in the research literature, in experimentation, in description, in conversation, and composition is the core of most basic human creativity. So the, the question of how to reliably compose existing knowledge, you know, A implies B, B implies C, and then via that process, you can get from A to C where the AI is constantly coming up with creative solutions that have never been seen before, but that just compose components of pre-existing solutions that everyone knows are reliable. Uh, much like a computer programmer is typically composing library calls with one another, or um, you know, an engineer is taking ideas from materials science and is using them in order to achieve uh, you know, a scramjet with particular properties of interest, or you know, is building you know, a rocket and has uh, novel and materials knowledge that can now be clearly factored into to the creation of a high quality rocket. So this knowledge composition is essential. Um, but the major step point is this, all three of these paradigms are reliable, novel forms of knowledge generation. Um, so one more thing that we do is we have this um, like GitHub to research paper pipeline. So if you are a developer and you have a GitHub account, uh, so actually who in here has a GitHub account and is uh, sort of an active developer? Okay, that's a huge fraction of, the, of those people. So if you have had any novel idea that made it into the code bases that you put up on GitHub, you can feed the GitHub repo to this system which will read through the code and discover what subset of it is novel. 
The way it checks for novelty is it'll look through the research literature citations that come out of its analysis of the code base. And then it can write a paper about the subset of your code base that is novel and of interest to the research community. And the paper, in this case, is about brain-computer interface foundation model benchmarks. So um, a team, uh, so the CEO of Neurosity, Ethan Keller, myself, and a few others, put this benchmark together for a brain-computer interface, which basically has um, a setup with multiple amplitude channels, so there's eight amplitude channels, and it lets you take actions on the basis of its predictions. So the, the, in particular, this hackathon is won by someone who uh, had the VCI speak for them with this combination of like a constructed language and um, a, a voice generator based on the language that they put together. But basically, we put out this data set for training foundation models for brain computer interfaces, and the paper that came out of the GitHub repo for the repository was close to immaculate. And so we saved 40 hours. And actually, in this case, we plausibly would not even have written the paper had we not had a system that could create a high quality version of it uh, reliably and quickly. Okay, um, so all of this has been pretty straightforward, but I'm gonna end with some very interesting questions. So um, everyone's very familiar with the agent's story, which I think is a example of a reframe, and it's kind of mind-opening, and you know, opens us up to an entire world of new companies and research proposals and ideas. And it's deeply anthropomorphic, which I guess appeals in a lot of ways to humans like us. But here's an anti-anthropomorphic reframe. It's called simulators. You can see foundation models as simulators of the underlying training content. So in the context of math, it's just simulating all the mathematical content that, say, that found on archive. Um, and so one question you may ask is, in what context does simulating the process of knowledge creation actually create real knowledge? Um, uh, there is a sense that has, is sort of heavy in academia, which is, most of these models hallucinate or can't be trusted. And that's just because all they're doing is simulating what they found online, what they found in papers, and sort of trying to predict whatever is most likely. And so if you reframe these as just being um, simulated in contexts, then you want to put the model in a context where simulation reliably creates high quality outcomes. And so in this case, if you're generating in LaTeX, or if you're generating in a scikit-learn style, or if you're generating mathematics, um, the kind of information that will come out of your simulator will be the sort of biased towards the assumptions of the context in which you're doing that simulation. Um, and then you want to ask about you know, truthful generation. So within what epistemology is this knowledge going to be created? So with what set scientific paradigm are you in? And how can you generate inside of that paradigm in a way that is truthful and consistent and correct and that makes progress moving the my uh, second reframe is this, it's the environment. So typically knowledge occurs in context and it, it means that you know something about. So currently I, I know something about the audience. There's, I'm in this room, I can see you. Uh, it's basically an interaction between me, who in this case you might represent as an agent, and the environment around me. And so there are deep questions that come up when you question the nature of the environment itself. Because what is knowledge about the environment when the environment is being dynamically and adaptively generated in order to be ideal? You know, in, scientists, uh, in science, there's this split between engineering and pure science. And even in mathematics, there's this question, oh, is math about invention or is math about discovery? And both of these questions allude in a loose way to this sense that uh, the environment may have some pre-existing thing that you're discovering but the environment may also be constructed by you in its entirety. And so one of the wonderful things is that in computer science, we are learning about these neural networks, but we also invented them. So you're in this context where your environment that you're trying to understand is an environment that is also created by you. Um, and so there are practical questions as soon as, say, the version of the web that you're using is a web simulator, where every single website that you engage with is generated, perhaps in totality. So. Um, and uh, you know, at AGI House, we have this sort of generative um, inspiration, like late last year at the Tools for Thought hackathons, where people started creating generative interfaces, and some people started going all the way and turning the entire application into a generated front end and a generated back end. And in the context of something like WebSim, which is one of the companies that came out of this new idea, 
um, there's this real sense that you can know something about the site, but that knowledge is, is very different from standard knowledge because the site itself can change in the face of your interaction with it. So certainly, uh, all of our interfaces can start to adapt to bring forward the things that we use most often, and that can be a simple and creative idea. But there's a very deep version of this where we treat AI primarily as the environment, and we actually optimize AIs to be effective as environments. And this is sort of deeply anthropomorphic and somewhat confusing, so what do you mean AI for environment? Well, it's there to basically be your context and allow you to achieve your goal where your goal is actually being fulfilled by the interface. And so, for example, in the case of the book generator, it's not just necessarily that you want an AI to write a book for you. You possibly want the AI to create the perfect interface by which you write the book, and then allow you to write the book through that creative interface. And so, you know, what does it mean to know how to use Excel when Excel itself is a generative backend and front end, which is adapted to you and to your use case. And so what it means is actually something deeper, which is you know sort of intuitively how the AI behind the generative variant of Excel is going to respond to what you do. And you are in these dynamic relationships with your applications that can lead to outcomes that the original developer of the application plausibly couldn't have imagined, especially if it's as abstract as something like WebSim, where the developer has you know, created 10,000 applications and certainly doesn't know the details of any one of them. And there's so many um, sort of fantastical things that you can do with that level of control. Um, and so in this case, what we know as knowledge is, is, is sort of confusing. And if you see AI as this environment, as opposed to as an agent or a chain, um, you end up to, getting to ask these uh, deep questions. So um, with that final reframe, I, I'll end off uh, please do think deeply about the ways in which all the assumptions that you have about the nature of knowledge and the nature of what AI is um, have limited your ability to creatively invent uh, the future that looks tremendous and glorious. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Oh, they are playing. Who wants to ask a question? Yeah. So you founded AGI House, and as an authoritative person, how far is AGI, and uh, how maybe what you talk about here can be uh, reflect towards AGI and how AGI as a concept should not be viewed as something static, but as a tool being used by the research frontier in order to realize the dreams of a collective. And so the question is not about when we reach AGI, because reaching it would defeat the purpose of the concept. In part, I named, I named AGI House AGI House because we got AGI by um, the definition of almost everyone who's been in AI until this decade. And I, it was actually um, during the summer of 2022, I got access to an early version of Claude. Um, and you know, as you know, the, uh, the RLHF, um, the folk who figured out construct fine tuning, made it possible to go from DaVinci 2 which was a sort of API that was a continue API. And there really wasn't a simulator's frame in an explicit way. And a lot of the advice around simulators was sort of flying around at that time because that's all they have to do is replicate the training stream. Um, the ability to, um, to, to modify it in Claude 1, which was actually released via a Slack bot. Uh, I don't know if you're on this math, it's a Slack channel with, uh, with access to Claude. Um, to me, this was just like night and day better than anything had seen. It could attempt to solve almost every problem we gave it, and it passed the Turing test beautifully in certain contexts. So uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, basically we got AGI in um, summer 2022 uh, by, by my definition. Now, there's a, there's a number of different definitions out there. Uh, OpenAI will give you a definition which says when 95% of the economy uh, can be executed by an AI, then we'll have AGI. And the issue with that definition, which is, should be obvious on its face, is that 
incrementally, parts of the economy will be automated by AI, and then the parts of the economy that are not AI will, um, will certainly like, uh, be the new 95%. And so you'll continually be like cracking down on that. Um, now, when will we get to 95% of the economy as of, say, 2022? Um, that's a super reasonable question, and um, my current estimates are like 2028. If you have another definition of AGI, then you'd like me to opine on it. I'm happy to. And when, when the super intelligence will be sentient, has feelings, knows uh, ethics. Yeah, I mean, the challenge with um, ethics is it's, it's primarily grounded sociologically and biologically. So you take your ethics from the people around you. Uh, if I have some new way of feeling, I can pass it to you. And it's very mimetic. And you'll see dramatic changes in ethics over time, where people decide that some things are now good and some things are now bad. And so you kind of have to replicate the mimetics of human societies uh, if you want a human style uh, ethics to be experienced. But then there's the experiencing layer, which, as far as I can tell, is primarily biological. So um, most conceptions of consciousness kind of miss the fact that in humans, the way we use the word consciousness has us come in and out of it on a regular basis. And a lot of that can be like neuroscientifically grounded, and really clearly grounded, in that if like your, your brain is chemical, like if you have some psychedelic, you predictably will go into really novel states. Um, and so I have very, strong sense that without the biological foundation, you're not going to have human-like experiences of consciousness or experience. And, and that's the grounding for most of our ethics at present, is like the suffering experience. Um, so yeah, if you're not going to replicate the grounding, you'll probably get something very different. I think there's a deeper question, which is how should AI make decisions? And um, yeah, that has you know, come to you worthwhile. for this session, but thank you so much, Jeremy, for <laughs> We're gonna take the next two minutes as a quick break, but at the same time, uh, please know that this also wraps up our keynotes, thanks to Jeremy and Chris. Um, from 11 o'clock onwards, we'll meet again in this room, so there will be two different tracks. One is a workshop track. Um, that will be in another room, it's called a tech or something of that sort.